This is Andrea Johnson from ICM Partners, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Welcome back to the Promoter 101 podcast. I'm Luke Pierce, back from my journey, and happy to be back on Promoter 101 with my partner in crime, Mr. Dan Steinberg. Welcome back, Luke. We just have a dandy of a show this week. True that, Dan. We're going to have CODA's Alex Hardy here to give us his take on the industry. Plus, we've got a war story from Belgium's Garcia Live, Sam Pearl, and of course, you're going to have the news of the week. So action-packed episode. That it is indeed. And before we get to that, Dan, if we can believe social media and all the photos swirling around it, you look like you had a great time across the pond at London at ILMC. So much fun. ILMC just gets better and better every year. What a great hang. Can I ask you this, Dan? I saw a photo of you moderating the agents panel, which was star-studded to say the least. ILMC every year takes a themed situation to its conference. Last year, it was Life on Mars or like the Outer Space. This year, being the 31st edition, it was Harry Potter themed. And they used the Harry Potter lightning bolt font for ILMC. And I saw a photo of you wearing what appeared to be a very Hogwartish outfit. It was a yellow and red striped outfit. It looked like something that like somebody from Gryffindor would wear. Did you plan that, Dan? No, actually about three minutes before the panel started, I was washing my hands in the bathroom and the soap shot all over my shirt and a nice polo on and quickly ran up to my room and grabbed the first thing that was on the stack. So that was the truth of that. Well, you look like you knew what you were doing with the Harry Potter themed stuff and excited to hear more about ILMC. Seems like a great time over there. Should we get through the podcast? Let's do it up, man. Hey, I'm Jake Layton Pope. Happy to be here with Dan on Promoter 101. Currently started a management company called Jake Layton Pope Management, and I need a better name. Have you missed any of the past Promoter 101 podcast? Well, we're here to help. We have a brand new website. It- When I say brand new, it's the original one that we've done no changes with. That it's just there to help you with all of the past episodes and current episodes if you want to check it out. This week, we feature a special reissue of episode 82. Episode 82 is quite the doozy. Had Dave Shapiro on the podcast joining us to talk about the heavier side of rock. Also, Aiken Promotions, Peter Aiken enlightens us about the rougher times in Ireland and the history and the current stage of the business. And we also had joining us from Aspen, Colorado, the autograph sources Rick Schultz stopping by to blow our collective minds about the world of collectibles. But AC Ted Heineck joins us for three questions. So, hey, if you're not too busy, drop us a review of this podcast or subscribe to Promoter 101. That would be fantastic. <music> This is Aaron Zimmerman, Vice President of Programming and Marketing at the Tobin Center in San Antonio. Yeehaw! News of the Week. So here is Luke Pierce joining us now with the updates of News of the Week. It's time for News of the Week. In a crazy two weeks it has been since the last time I delivered News of the Week, a lot has been happening. But I want to start with a very important story, one regarding streaming giants and songwriters. Last week, Spotify, Amazon, Google, and Pandora joined together in a legal appeal to the 44% increase in payments to songwriters that was set last year by the United States Copyright Rate Board. The increase, which was only the second increase in more than 110 years for songwriters, was nearly universally heralded as a win for songwriters, but is now being challenged by the streaming giants, with a notable exception. Apple Music chose not to join the challenge in the rate increase. The move, of course, sparked inflammatory responses from David Israelite, the National Music Publishers Association, Prexy, and songwriters, publishers, lawyers, and artists the world over. We'll have to stay tuned to this event, but I want to say to the youths out there listening, for those of you who support songwriters as important members of the creative community and important creative partners, please consider moving your music over to Apple Music and streaming off of Apple Music until this rate resolution is dropped. Thank you. Bowery, again, making moves to complete the vertical in Boston. Bowery Presents announced on Wednesday 
plans to construct a brand new 3,500 cap venue in Boston Landing's development in the Brighton neighborhood opening in fall 2021. The venue will expand Bowery's venue ownership and footprint, including the 220 cap Great Scott, the 525 cap Sinclair in Cambridge, and the 1200 cap Royale, in addition to its booking interest in clubs and theaters throughout the area. Said friend of the pod and VP of Boston, Josh Boddy, the Bowery Presents is a rich history of developing artists and offering fans great live music experiences from small to large venues. We're excited to bring our passion for developing the best venues for artists and fans alike to the Boston Landing. Boston Landing is currently home to the New Balance World Headquarters, the Boston Celtics, and Boston Bruins training facilities and companies like Boston Dynamics and Roche Diagnostics. And finally, some news from Music City. WME is winning again as Bobby Cudd, friend of the pod and lover of soups and hot chicken, joins WME's Nashville office. Bobby brings a roster that includes Dave Rawlings, The Doyle and Debbie Show, Gillian Welch, I'm With Her, Junior Brown, Casey Chambers, Old Crow Medicine Show, Robert Earl King, Ricky Skaggs, Sarah Jaros, and more to the Nashville agency. Previously, Cud was the sole remaining agent at Billions Agency, which has seen its Nashville office lose agents to Paradigm and WME over the last three years. Prior to that, Cud spent nearly three decades at Monterey Peninsula Artists, which later became Paradigm. That'll do it for News of the Week. This is Andy Levitt with Live Nation Comedy. You're listening to Promoter 101. In our first interview this week, here to share a special war story from Belgium, Garcia's Lives, Sam Pearl. We got Sam Pearl here with a war story about the early days when your dad was in the business, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when my father would make it happen, he uh, promoted the Michael Jackson's concert. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was an open air in Ostend. And me and my brother were little kids and I was six years old. And my, my brother was eight year old. My father liked us around and, and my mom was always around. So it was like a family excursion, let's say, from mm-hmm. time to time. I remember that it took until 1, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning until they finished the first night with the settlement, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they weren't finished probably, but that's when the night stopped. And I remember that me and my brother, uh, during the second part of the concert, unfortunately, we were very young. We dozed out. My father and my mom, they brought us to the car. They brought down the back seats and we slept there until three in the morning. So that was one of my first vivid experiences with the concert business. So yeah, we were sleeping in the back of the car and while Michael Jackson was singing as well. So yeah, it's oh, not, wow. the, not something I'm proud of, but we're young, so very young. You're ashamed that you didn't stay awake to see Michael Jackson when yeah, you were a little we kid? Were, yeah, we didn't have a lot of conscience back then. I mean, yeah, 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 you can't blame yourself for that. But you were there. You got yeah, to see the mask yeah, yeah. of a Michael Jackson yeah, show. How yeah. cool is that? There was one and, and he always took us to shows. So uh, yeah. What's well, so. the coolest show that you got to see when you were a kid that your dad promoted? But it must be pretty Prince, Prince, definitely Prince. How cool is that? That was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I was a bit older. I was 14, 15, and he played the Flanders Expo in Ghent. And that I can remember very vividly. It was something amazing. Yeah, yeah. I never saw somebody perform like he did. And then after that, he went, he did his after shows and next tracks. I was too young to attend. I think maybe that's the one thing you don't hear about too much is how great a guitarist he is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, hidden yeah, behind absolutely. his other persona. Yeah. He was one of the very most amazing guitar players on that level with a Satriani or a Clapton type player. Absolutely. Absolutely, but yeah. because he was known for his singing, you never really hear about that. But growing up backstage, man, so yeah, how yeah. fucking cool yeah, is that? Yeah. And I stayed away from the drugs and the drinking. So, <laughs> well, good. Then your parents my, were doing my their dad job. Did a good job. Yeah. Good job. All right, the great Sam telling a war story. We're looking forward to your interview coming up in just a couple of weeks on Promoter 101. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sam's just a cool guy, and we're looking forward to having the full interview with him in just a couple of weeks. This is Eddie Clemens from United Talent Agency. I'm here on Promoter 101. Tweet. Tweet. Tweets of the week. Hey, you've made it this long enough. It's time for Tweets of the Week, a great Thursday tradition. Let's start here. Agents tend to choose the promoter of least resistance. So hopefully that's me. There's nothing you can't do with a budget and a Google search. The power of the internet and throwing money at a problem can just fix damn near anything, Luke. That's the truth. You never know how deep the other guy's relationships and checkbooks run. Well, until it's too late anyway. That'll do it for some tweets of the week. You can always follow Dan on Twitter. He's at the Jew. Don't follow too closely. Fergie, Tour Design. I'm on Promoter 101. In our feature interview this week, we've got Coda's Alex Hardy here to give us his take on the industry. Alex Hardy of Coda, thank you so much for taking time. That's all right. You've worked with some of the coolest acts in the biz. You started out in the comedy side. Eddie Izzard, you're legendary in the comedy side. That's where you got your roots, right? 
Well, my brother was a stand-up comedian, so that's how I got into that. I looked after at university. I'd put on shows with Steve Coogan, Eddie Izzard, Frank Skinner. He was one of the people. Um, Harry Enfield, I think, Jerry Sadovich. So, yeah, I had a good pedigree. I used to have a company called Ha 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 The Arts. That's how I started comedy. And now with the join up with ITG, they look after comedians like Steve Coogan and Harry Hill. So it's gone. Actually, I started off Harry Hill as well. So it's gone full circle. So is that how you get into the business? Your brother was a comic and he needed somebody to help him? Well, the way I got into the business was I was at university and I was very into Luke Reinhardt. I don't know if you know who he is. I don't. I imagine he's been here. He's better read. He's a dice man. I was very much into that book at the time when I was doing my A-levels. And I was also sadly into Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do because I was quite good at O-level level. I, before I discovered... Um, drinking drugs I sort of was a straight A student so I had a choice between the science and English and I just wrote down all the courses and rolled a 20-sided dice and I got aeronautical engineering which I absolutely knew nothing about so when I was at university I realised I was in a class doing a degree and I got through two years of something I had absolutely no interest in whatsoever. You picked your subject in college by rolling a 20-sided dice to pick which subject just randomly you were going to take. Yeah, yeah, I did. That's amazing. I also used the same technique. I didn't really research it of which university to go to and what halls of residence. So I put down three halls of residence. One was St. Gabriel's Hall, which because I liked Peter Gabriel at the time. <laughs> and then I got a letter back saying, you do realise this is a girl's halls of residence. One of them was called Hardy Farm which was my second name, so I ended up there, which was another bad choice because that was 10 miles out of the city centre. Yeah, but I just was very bored, so I started putting on comedy nights, like up something called Northwest Comedian of the Year, which Dave Spikey won, who then went on to work with Peter Kay. And I went on my second year of after passing, they said, we now have to look at your career in engineering. They said, if you go into an apprentice, we can get you in Hatfield Air- Aeronautical Engineering Zone, or they said, you'll be on... 16 grand a year I went well I'm already owned about 20 grand a year just putting on part time comedy clubs so I quit that day the money was already there so you moved into music into the 90s what made the transition for you the transition was not actually voluntary (laughs) what happened was Manchester at those times it was known as Manchester so it was when Hacienda and the Stone Roses and Ease and dance music started to come into its own so I got quite caught up into that side of things and then it became I was running comedy clubs out of rave night clubs and it then became known as Gunchester. So I actually bought my first house up there and I was living with an ex-paratrooper, Chelsea Headhunter. You won't believe this, but he fell in love with one of our friends and he had a gun under his bed and woke up every night in cold sweats and had a list of all my friends on. It's terrifying. <laughs> I know. So and one day I was in a club called the PS3 and it was one of the early rave nights or one of the, you know, it's about the end of the real rave scene and he came up and went, all right, Lockie, you look, you look good tonight. And he went, what do you mean? And he was very paranoid on drugs, and he turned around and snapped my nose in half. And I went, wow. <laughs> that's the only time I've ever run away from anything in my life. <laughs> it's but a good a, time to run away. A, a combination of the actual time and the, lots of shootings going on, lots of crazy things that I just decided, oh, I'm, I'm coming back to London. <laughs> wow. I sold half my comedy business, went back to London, which I'm from London, ran out of money, decided I better do something. So I applied to... All the agencies, music agencies, there wasn't, I couldn't work back in comedy because I signed with a six month non compete. Non compete. I got a letter from the Concord agency and they said, Can you come in? So I came in. The idea was for me to start setting up comedy. That's what I had said on the letters exchange. We didn't have emails really in those days, but I have to work for six months before I could do this. So I didn't know I had much chance. I went into the Concord, who at the time were looking after acts like Nirvana, Miss Wet T-shirt, and all the rave acts. So it was a weird combination. I went to the toilet just before the interview, and there was a picture of my brother naked, framed in the toilet. (laughs) Because my brother used to dance with balloons naked. It was one of his... Comedy bits. Yeah. (laughs) So I went to the interview, I went to Louis Parker, and went, why have you got a picture of my brother in your toilet? And he went, you're Malcolm Hardy's brother. You got the job. Who you know, right? <laughs> there you go. So there was a tighter Ronnie size too, right? Yeah, Ronnie size was one of my first. So Concord, I went in there initially with an eye to go on to comedy. But as I got into music, I realized when I was doing comedy, you just traveled around England. When you do music, it's universal. So there's no language restriction, which I enjoyed a lot more at that time in my life. So I stayed in music and Rave had come down to London and I enjoyed the prodigy, sadly, Keith, um, who prodigy we look after, sadly, Keith, a few days ago passed away. They were the sort of bands that all of us worked on the same acts and we just booked all the same raves. It was a very different business from now but then it's mutated into the drum and bass scene 
and I picked up Ronnie Size and you know that's how I learned the game of hard tickets and brute and proper tours because he won the Mercury Prize he started selling out big venues got critical acclaim and from then I think I got a band called the Sister, Scissor Sisters they consequently sacked me <laughs> I remember John Gidding saying well if you want loyalty in the music business get a dog <laughs> that sounds like Giddings I got a dog and that ran away as well <laughs> Oh, man, that's terrible, but it's awesome. How did the CODA thing come? You obviously jumped from Concord to CODA at some point. No, what happened was Solomon Parker, who's Louis' son, he now was from William Morris. He was the vice president of William Morris. He's at CODA now, and Chris Hearn, who was at primary. So we all started together. There's about an 18-year passage, and now we're all back together again. That's kind of an awesome reuniting. I know. But I had to leave Concord. I mean, I showed Solomon. I've still got my first invoice, and I had to do other sort of maybe not so legitimate things when I was an agent to bring with to uh, manage to survive in London. Um, we used to only invoice a third of whatever we earned. That was a system. No mm-hmm. wage. Killed what you eat. Yeah. Well, that was how it worked. So like, my first invoice, I think, for the first three months was, you know, £1,600, which is... For three months. Yeah. <laughs> so it's tight. And no wage. So I couldn't carry on. You know, Concord, I Louis taught me everything, you know, all the basics I knew, but it wasn't even in those days, when without William Morris or a CAA, it was a boutique agency. It actually got a lot bigger when I left and they started getting some, but it was more of a PA and nightclub and, as I said, wet T-shirts. And <laughs> You don't really have these anymore, but it was like a cabaret stroke music agency. Nirvana, when I went there, was our biggest client, but they had left. So we just did rave acts and it was after I left that they got some more legitimate acts like East 17 and... Westlife, I think, and it wasn't a place that I could really become an agent. And so I approached MPI, which was Miracle Prestige International, which had Phil Banfield and Steve Parker, who runs Audience now. They had a massive advantage over Concord. They were actually going to give me a wage, which seemed very (laughs) (laughs) appealing at the time. Money would be helpful living in London. I mean, I I quite pride myself on being very straightforward and honest. And and Chris Hearn, who works with us now, you know, I said, look, we have to leave on the 31st of the month because... I have to put that last invoice in, otherwise I can't afford to like, right, pay my rent. Get paid, yeah. So I said, look, Chris, we're all go up and leave together. But Chris actually crumbled under the pressure of this on his head and left five days before we were all meant to leave. Started the pieces in motion, huh? Well, yeah, but the worst thing was that Louis, who I greatly loved and respect, and he then sat me down and said, are you planning to leave as well? And I never try and make these really big lies in life, but I had to say to him straight in his face, I'm not going to leave. Because I couldn't, I couldn't eat if I didn't. So I sort of regret that to this day. But but you needed to get paid so you could. Well, I literally survive. needed to get paid to to pay my rent, so I wasn't homeless. So yeah, <laughs> you're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, so I went to MPI, then Steve Parker and Phil Banfield fell out, and was at another position. Do you want to come with me, or do you want to come with me, you? So Phil Banfield had Sting, Steve Parker had 10cc at that point. I thought I better go with the one with the bigger axe. And then Chris Hearn, who we mentioned earlier on, he was came with me, but he got poached by Priory, which was a big new... At that point, there was a very big agency that was like competing with the ITBs and the Helter Scales. It was a young, fresh blood. So he, he lived with me as well. He lived in my house and he said one day, by the way, I'm going to Priory. I went, well, thanks for telling me that because I actually work for the company that you... <laughs> <laughs> so now I've got to keep that secret. Right. I can't betray you. And but anyway, he left. I rang up all the other agencies at first and no one wanted to give me a job so I said to Phil the owner I went we've lost Chris he's one of our biggest agents we're not going to survive unless we join with some forces with someone else I said look there's another agency called Constant Clinics who's Clive Underhill Smith and Rob Chalice I said let's see if we can join and form a sort of a new hybrid agency so at that time Clive who's no longer an agent he had some great acts he had Paul's head he had he had Air which was a massive back yeah huge so we formed an allegiance, moved into Shoreditch ahead of our time, and we called ourselves Coda. It's built into a huge thing, and now you guys are partners with Paradigm. Yeah, Paradigm own a percentage of us. So now that you're all tied together with Paradigm and all these other agencies, you guys are a full-service agency of all of the branding and all of the other resources yeah. and film and literature I mean, available. The branding team just in Coda now is sort of 60. So it's massive. That's massive for a European agency, but then we've got ITG who've just started up a podcast production company. They have a branding team probably of 20 
plus another 20, 35 in digital. So we're trying to repeat what the full service agencies are like in America because that doesn't really exist over here. That American tie with all those resources there when you sign an act here and having the ability to have a worldwide presence when you're signing an act, does that help and is that exciting to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's very hard not to have a global footprint now when signing acts. I mean, especially as I'm, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on you are, most of the new big talent is being broken out of America because you rigged the game again. You got the biggest streaming base, haven't you? So, oh, America itself? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll apologize for America for being ahead of the game. Well, no, no, you're ahead. You're just bigger. <laughs> if you're bigger, then you've got bigger playlists to start your acts off, haven't you? Yeah, it's just a numbers game at that point. Well, that's what it is now, isn't it? Like breaking acts. Not, what do people look at? They look at streaming and Instagram. So is that the future of the business? Is the numbers and the size you think is it such a global game? I, things change and you never know. I don't see how it can't be now, you know. I'm just worried about the next step is when you have AI and biotech and then they start getting algorithms to write all the songs because they're better than humans at doing it. But <laughs> see what happens. I hope that we don't, we don't get machines writing songs that have charting higher than humans. That would be a bit sad, won't it? It would be a little weird for sure. So you've been on both sides. You were an independent. Now you're at a fairly major agency, top six agency in the world. Do you think it's possible to start an independent boutique agency now and compete with the big boys? Yeah, well, we are competing because, I mean, in Europe, I mean, I'm based in Europe. So in America, I think Paradigm is sits now musically in the top three, doesn't it? Top three, top four, something like that, yeah. Yeah, but we're all, everyone include and Paradigm, it's all come from a, we've all been entrepreneurs. So I think that entrepreneurial spirit still runs through the company and we can get big, but we don't want to become so corporate that people can hide. Everyone's visible and, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit still exists and is driving it. You know, Paradigm was a little big man. It was Monterey, it was... Windish, it was AM only. It's always been lots of different entrepreneurial units that have been pieced together, and that's still how the company functions. So it, it is different, maybe, from working at a William Morris or a CIA, I think. Okay, so you've got this new world where it's a global world and you're competing with agents when you're signing X that have all of these tools in their toolbox. Is that something that all the artists want to see now is the ties to branding and literature and maybe film? Is that is that now part of the normal conversation? Depends on which act. And, you know, I always start, I say, look, we've got a brat, we've got a literary team, we've got a film, we, you know, we have some of the best directors in the UK. In ITG, we have a branding team, but we're sitting here at the beginning and it's all about music and it, no no real brands will want you until we build your brand in music. So the music has to come first. You know, you're not going to be offered a film part after your first track you released on streaming. It's very unlikely, no matter what we can do. So if you want all those things and you're a musician firstly, then let's, we have to build that side of your career first. Do you think that's an important part of the signing process is managing the expectation of the artist? Yeah, I mean, you have to management, managing artists and managers sometimes expectations is the most important part, you know. It takes a long time to break an act, a lot longer, and you can't just throw money at it. So you're not going to just walk into my agency and be suddenly an A-list Hollywood celebrity film star. That's not just happen. We have agents who do that, but we have to build something. We have to have a plan together. You know, and my, hopefully most people who come in anyway, their first career is music. When I see them, if we can flip it over, if there's a spark, if there's something there, then we have that facility now in the agency. If there's brands, deals are starting to be interesting. We have people who know how to negotiate that. But, you know, you have to create something. The people that brands don't usually pluck an, an unknown out of the middle of nowhere and say, we want you to be your brand ambassador. You have to create, you have to have a plan of how you're going to get the brands interested. And that's what we can do. When you're signing an act, what's the first thing that catches your eye? Is it the music? Is it the live show? Well, unfortunately, you don't see many. <laughs> that was how it used to work. I'm more likely to go to a studio and listen to music because there's not that many bands out there and there's not that many hot gigs you go down to see and there's every A&R person in people write with other writers. So it's, in my world, what I do is mainly pop music. So it's mainly not going to come from a local gig or someone... I can't remember the last act I've signed at seeing them live. It's usually from getting music from producer and manager, a record label. I actually miss the days of seeing that buzz gig and everyone's down there and you see everyone looking shitting themselves because they don't know who's got it. It doesn't really happen so much. I mean, there was so it's a, more there, about who you know and be, being in the network that that, that stuff's getting offered yeah, to you. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there was a band called Joseph, I think that. A lot of people went up to Glasgow last week. That was the last one I heard everyone chasing. You know, that, that used to be happening four times a week. You'd be at gigs looking for bands like that and everyone would be in the same venue. But it doesn't really happen so much anymore, you know. There's not so many bands in just full stop, isn't there? When people can write on Logic all on their own, why do they want to be held up by four of them lesser talented mates? <laughs>
that band camaraderie and getting into a, you don't need to go you don't need a bass guitar player and you know so a lot of people who can write songs will just write it on their own won't they and then when they perform live then they bring a band session musicians in big fight seems to be who has the power now with the tour deal becoming available on every level with AEG and Live Nation both offering earlier and earlier and younger tour deals so is it the tour promoter that's the power the agents the manager who has the power well, I said on the panel with Live Nation, I mean, Live Nation have a lot of power at the moment. They're buying everything. But I said, you know, like, was with Phil Bowdry was on the panel. I said, you're in a very powerful position, but when you have power, you're like a hammer. And if you start looking at everything as a nail, then that's when you fuck up. So you have to have some humility with power. You know, at the moment, the other AEG and the other promoters, they need to sort of get their act together against Live Nation because their portfolio is so big of festivals. But I don't understand, unless you need money or unless you're worried about your commission and you can get it in advance, why you sign yourself to one... I don't understand why you want to, would never want to be a free agent in life if you don't have to be. So if you decentralise the dates and as the agent you can do that because you have those skills, you can keep the control. Yeah, and but what, you know, just in life, if you didn't have to sign a record deal sometimes, if you had that choice that someone gave you money and you didn't have to be tied up, you'd always be a free agent. Being a free agent where you can accept offers or you can look at everything and then go, that's my choice. Give you the flexibility to do other it's things. Nev- it's, there's never going to be a better scenario than that. You know, you don't ever want to tie your, in any warp or business or any life being a free agent is the best situation before i let you go can you give some advice from agents coming up behind you in the industry on how to succeed i would say you need to have a good ground in knowledge of music it surprised me how sometimes i put out support to her and the suggestions i get back are so irrelevant that i can't understand that people don't have that basic grasp of this is this type of music this is this type of music that won't work with that no please don't put some left field electronic thing to support a pop show yeah well just really things that you just can't believe that there are some agents out there that don't have that grasp but you know just have a grasp of where things sit and yeah i think fairness is like not what it used to be like being an agent but you want to work best for your bands but it's a symbiotic relationship like all be, all, all deals of things work if both people win in the scenario if everyone's losing all the time then it doesn't win so yeah, it won't go on forever if everybody's yeah, yeah. Losing. so you have to look at the wider thing and you know so you're like a flea on a dog. If you drain that dog too hard of blood, it's going to die. Thank you so much for taking the time and talk to me. I truly enjoyed this. No problem. Alex is possibly the most entertaining interview we've ever had. It's just really cool to get in the room with him and just see how he thinks and processes. And you can clearly see that he is just on a whole different level. Hi, I'm Leslie Olenek from Live Nation Touring, and I'm on Promoter 101. That'll do it for this episode of Promoter 101. I'm going to give a special thanks to everybody listening to this podcast, to our guest, Coda's Alex Hardy, and Christina Lives, Sam Pearl. If you liked what you heard here, let us know about it. Send us a note. It doesn't cost you anything. You can hit us at Steiny at Promoter 101. We'll be back Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. on the coast. And that's midnight London time, y'all. Join us on Monday when our special guest is United Center's Jerry Goldman. Until then, we're wishing you sold out shows for the week to come. Cheers. On your mother. This is John Giddings, and I'm on Promoter 101. Bye.